I did something I, I, I don't normally do. I adjudicated a competition uh, there for the Bono or for Padre Oreda, and I was given, I think, about 80 or 90 fiddle players to, to listen to beforehand. But the one, the one message that I took out of that experience was that Tommy was probably the, the most influential fiddle player of his generation. Big statement. Simple as. Well, he was a very handsome man. I used to think he was a cross between Elvis and Johnny Cash. <laughs> And that for me was something that was unique about Tommy Peoples. There's no way, like, I don't think that anybody could mistake his music for anybody else. It's so unique. Maybe in around as early as 10, we would have had recordings of John Doherty and Tommy Peoples in the house. And both those players, to me, stood out because they played music like I hadn't really heard, I suppose in a session scenario, because the music had such clarity. And it just, for want of a better word, it just grabbed me, you know, even from an early age. He said, have you met Tommy people yet? No, I said, I heard about it. You want to make it your business to meet him? He's some player. So uh, I said, what style does he play? He did uh, plays like Tommy Fables. Yeah, he was a good character, but he had an, an immense, as I say, respect for the purity of melody. You could hear it in his compositions and, and the way he played. You, you would never hear a vulgar note from Tommy Fables, not even one vulgar note. The tone he could get out from the first, he would draw a bow across a fiddle. You knew it was Tommy. He had this unique tone and he had depth and sweetness and yet there was bite in it. And uh, that's, that's hard to get. You, you, I, I like a bit of bite in it and there's, there's a rawness there. Uh, it wasn't about technical skill, although he had that in abundance. Uh, that was the depth of feeling. It, it, his heart was in it. Uh, he was. Uh, I think. Ev I think he meant every note he played. He meant it with his whole heart. How would I describe it? It's a bit like. If you take, say, the music as a, as, a, as, a, as a huge big garden that has been kind of pretty well kind of manicured and looked at and all that, and the one thing that it doesn't have is the wildflowers. Tommy was the wildflower for me. That kind of made that garden, in, that garden interesting, as opposed to the bland, you know, sort of, kind of lovely, beautifully manicured and really nice and it's lovely. The gentian violet will be over in the corner, you know. And they might only come up for six or seven weeks of the year, but it was there, but it came every year. So that's sort of the way I would feel about it. Well, from what I've heard, you know, that recording made when he was 13 is very much St. Johnson, I would say. And then later hearing him in around 1969, which is the only thing I've really heard from that early years in Dublin, I would have said he had moved on further down the road to me and Tommy Peoples. But I think he, that Dublin experience and the Clare experience and meeting what was a golden generation of players, you know, everybody from Matt Mulhoy to Mary Bergen to Sean Keane. I mean, that was a forcing ground for, and that's, uh, that's what really put him into the stratosphere. He loved playing in here. He could relax, you see. And he was, he was playing, he could, uh, he, he could turn the jig into a reel, just out of the top of his head. He had an immense amount of capability playing a, a Strats Bay. Now, if you want to talk about minimum movement for maximum effect, 
he has it there in spades. But it's so tuneful. And the purity, it's this purity of melody that I always stuck out. He was so economical with his movement that sometimes you could look at him and wonder, you know, do his fingers move at all for, for, the, for the output? Like he used to do these uh, double grace notes on the high B. So, you know, he'd leave his finger on the A and he'd just bounce the baby finger. Um, it didn't look like much, but the sound, you know, because normally at home and Claire was doing anything like that, uh, the sound to me was like, what is he doing? You know, because it was hard to, to catch it, if you know what I mean. So like the triplets, I would have tried the triplets for days and weeks and months and I was like, Dad, will you just tell me what is the story like? So he's going to just snap, snap and release, snap and release. Uh, so the finger flying up was in the end, energy kind of left when the snap finished, his fingers would go up, mine go down. You really need to somebody to come in and say, come on Tommy, and, uh, while you're playing it, just to get that authentic. So it was just the, the feeling of so much music there to, to come out and the, the, the attack and the, the sort of youthful, the, the vigor and the just that uh, thing that's just left so many unforgettable moments like the Bothy Band 75 album, The High Part of the Road the exciting session with one of Ireland's leading fiddle players. You know, that was Tommy at full tilt. I remember playing with him with Lister Vernon one night and this woman came up and I was asking him, oh, you, do, you flick your finger when you're doing that. And I remember him trying to explain it a couple of times and, and it's like explaining the inner workings of a car under the bonnet when they know how to fill the petrol. And he knew he could be there for a week and it still wouldn't make sense. So this woman came up to him and said, um, oh, and, and you, it's, it's a flick, don't you, you, hit the, you hit it with your finger. And he goes, yeah. And off she went happy enough, she was happy with that. And I turned around to him and goes, why did you say that to her? And he goes, it's just easier. I'd been asked to do a piece for Sunday Miscellany, which is an RTE programme. And I had thought of doing it on Danny Meehan's account of uh, when he and Tommy met John Doherty uh, up in the, in the Glen of Glenties, in the Glen Tavern. And it was a great story. And I, I sort of, on a wider level, I sort of saw it as John Doherty, the Prince of Donegal fiddle playing, meeting the new, the new, you know, the new generation, person from the next generation. So I sent a copy of this to Tommy, and uh, I think the, uh, yeah, the, the, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel was mentioned as part of this. <laughs> I think it's sort of over egg the pudding a wee bit, you know, where God touches man and all that sort of thing. So uh, Tommy came back and, and they, he says, you know, I have the greatest respect uh, for the music of the Doherty's, and I met them uh, several times, uh, but anything I got, I got from the fiddlers of East Donegal I got from, and the people of East Donegal. If any baton was handed to me, it was from the people of East Donegal. I once heard Joe Burke Describe, describe him as, have, uh, as having played good, sincere music. And I think that was probably one of the most accurate comments ever I heard about Tommy's music, you know. I mean, it was such a gift to hear the uh, high part of the road. It's because it kind of uh, gave you an idea of what could be done, you know, and uh, it gave you an insight into some the, the the approach and the delivery of somebody who's just a master, master performer, you know. It's like, like that old man said in London, Mike Nabola, he said he plays like Tommy Peoples. 
and I knew exactly what it meant. And nobody will ever play like him. You'd be a fool to try to play like them with people. There are great players, but there's always a handful who stick out in any, in any hundred years. And Tommy Peebles, I'm proud to say it, that I knew him personally, and he played in here and slept in here. I think in every generation, one or two people come along that make the difference. And I think Tommy made a difference. I think he made a huge difference. I think he opened up a whole sort of a musical vista for a generation of musicians. Uh, that, you know, a very, very beautiful vista, it has to be said, and a very wild one. And I think, as I said to you, said, you know, having adjudicated that competition, I think I would put him down as sort of maybe the, the most influential fiddle player of his generation.